Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Uh, I'm here with my masala chai, with many of my friends in the audience, wonderful sunny Jaipuri day, and at this wonderful festival. Thank you, everybody, for inviting us, and thank you for having this session signed as well. Um, I'm with the very wonderful writer and lovely man, Colin Thubron, who is intrepid, uh, bold, and brilliant at opening up parts of the world about his new book, well, his book that came out last year, it's called The Amur River, here it is, available in the bookstalls afterwards, with a signature from the great Colin Zubron, included at no extra price, I think, no extra cost, um, to, talk about, to talk about the Amur River between Russia and China, possibly already sold out. We'll find out on eBay. Uh, tell us, Colin, you've traveled to so many different parts of the world. Why did you choose the Amur River? And tell us what your journey is all about. Well, can I be heard? Yes, good. Um, I have been traveling in Russia and China for a good many decades. And this is the part, the Amur River, where the two countries actually meet. Um, Manchurian China to the south, um, Siberian Russia to the north. And um, it seemed to be uh, almost, well, people say, this must be surely your last book. Um, it's where these two great rivers find their terminus. And I do fi did find it intensely interesting because nobody's ever heard of it. It's the 10th longest river in the world and almost nobody has ever heard of it. Um, I don't know if we've got a map up there. We haven't, I don't think. Um, but it runs in a great S bend out of Mongolia um, and uh, like this, um, Siberia to the north and flows into the Pacific eventually after almost 3,000 miles. Um, it's an astonishing river because um, it's uh, undammed. Um, if there were dams on it, that would have to be agreed by the countries on either side. And the countries on either side don't trust one another enough to create dams. So you find that it's a, it's a river that is almost sunk out of memory for most of us. Um, certainly in the West, I think in India. So um, my reasons for going there were almost um, to see where these, how these two countries, Russia and China, reacted to one another on the ground. Um, Moscow and Beijing talk politics to one another, talk peace to one another. But I wondered then um, what actually was the reality of Russians and Chinese when they met together on that great river. So one of the wonderful things about all your books is that you are always talking about the natural landscape and then dropping in and out of politics. So it's not a history book, it's, but it's also not a geography book and it's not a travel book. I mean, most people, when they see a long river, think, oh, there's a long river. Then they might think, I've never heard of the Amur. Not many people think 3,000 miles are by myself. Well, I don't think you did buy yourself a new pair of shoes, but you thought, I'm going to walk or I'm going to travel the whole, whole length of it. Was, it. was the Amur the obvious project for you to do? I remember hearing you talking six or seven years ago in Jaipur about a trip you did in the Himalayas and your Sherpas all fainting one by one and you keep on going. Where does this drive to see this with your own eyes and to open ours, where does that come from? Um, it came from a realization that almost is nothing written about in the West about this river. So. Um, I think what a travel book does, perhaps, is introduce you to somewhere, not, um, not only intellectually, um, but sensuously, if you like. You, get, you should get the feel of the river, of the landscape, of the people along it. Um, it's one of the gifts of travel writing, uh, as opposed to looking at somewhere on a television screen um, or of reading about it in an academic journal. You travel with the, um, with the writer. It's a, it's a shared experience, you hope between the writer and the reader. So um, my impetus for doing this um, was really a, a one of discovery. There are not many places in the world where you feel there's still something to be discovered. And even at its source um, in Mongolia, um, it's a very, uh, it, it, it's extremely, nobody really knew where the source of the river was um, until a few years ago, Russia and China convened together to try to decide where the river rose, um, hoping, of course, that it would be in China and Russia, respectively. They found to their chagrin that it arose in the mountains of northeast Mongolia, 
which was very disappointing to them. Um, but there, of course, I wanted to trace it. Now, when, when I started reading your book quite early on, I thought it was going to be a very short book. Will, will, you, will you do us a, a, a reading about when you get onto a horse um, and to begin part of the journey from the Amor to go from the West to the East? Can, would you mind do, reading from your book? Okay. Um, this was the, the tough start of the journey. Um, it's an area of northeast Mongolia, which is called, a, it, it's a forbidden area um, to travel, as I had to get special permission. When I arrived, I had two Mongolian horsemen with me and a guide, um, a, a Mongolian guide. And um, the waters on the border of the area, it's about 5,000 miles of restricted area, marshland mainly, on the border with Russia. Um, they disclaimed any responsibility for us. We had to sign documents because um, they said we can't, if something goes wrong, we can't save you here. Um, we haven't got a helicopter, let, there are no roads here. Um, nobody's allowed to live here. You're on your own. So we went off with these um, rather um, uh, foolishly, I guess, because the monsoons have been heavy that year and this was marshland. Um, I will read you a very brief um, account. I mean, amazing. I mean, I, I've never, never travelled in that way where you're told that there's not even an Uber for you. I mean, I've travelled quite remotely, but to be told there are thousands of restricted miles and you have to sign disclaimers that if you don't come back, your body will be left to rot yeah. where it falls. Yeah. Well, but, um, it's, uh, it's, well, some people say brave, others say foolish. Um, uh, okay. Yes, I can have some glasses if you like. Do you want me to hold your microphone? Okay. This is very short, anyway. We were entering a region that even the horsemen did not know. For four days, they guided our way by the mountains that now surrounded us. The source of the Onon Amur was tiny and diffused when we found it. Ahead of us, it flowed invisibly, its course low and flat through valleys of knee-high shrubs. From a distance, the ground looked innocent, almost landscaped, but its marsh had rotted over the millennia into fathomless bog. Soon I lost count of the tributaries we forded. The horsemen charged in like centaurs, the current streaming over their knees, their cigarettes still dangling from their lips. My own horse was old, and I felt a clutch of fear each time he descended. The fear, I had to say, was justified because as we went on uh, over several days, um, the horses, which were used to the hard Mongolian steppe, couldn't cope with this marshland. They panicked, they rolled, and um, I was thrown several times. I had a broken ankle and two broken ribs. At the end, I remember, the horse simply, my, my foot was clogged by mud in the stirrup, the horse rolled through me and then started dragging me through the marsh with my foot still in the stirrup. Fortunately, um, I only had very loose trainers on and I managed to extract my foot from the stirrup. The horse went off with my trainer and I was left in the marsh. And my poor guide on the far side saw the horse emerge from the marshland with a shoe attached. And he thought, oh, he's gone, that's the end of him. Um, but I emerged much later, and then you wonder what you do um, with um, uh, this damage. I persuaded myself that the ribs were only bruised and the ankle was only sprained, and, and I carried on rather foolishly. But the alternative was to go back to Ulaanbaatar, the capital of Mongolia. They'd have flown me back from London. They'd have said everything's broken. And I've had to start the journey all over again. In other words, um, you lose a year of your life um, and uh, at my age, which is, I, well, I won't tell you, um, it's over 80 anyway, um, you can't leave, afford to lose a year of your life. So I, I just carried on following the river. You say, you say yes, quite right. Yeah. I love that I persuaded myself, yes, that my ribs were only bruised. They were broken. They were broken, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and the ankle? The ankle was also broken. But <laughs> what, you, you can't do anything. I'm, as probably anybody that's broken ribs knows, um, you can't do anything. You can't put them in casing. You just have to rest. And you have to remember not to cough and not to laugh 
I was told, well, I didn't have a cough, and there was nothing to laugh about. So, so we carried on. So tell us about that. Tell us about the, the difference between the physical landscapes where you will ride or, or later walk or travel for long distances without seeing anybody, and then when you come to small settlements, to villages, what are the people like along the Amur? Do they change as you get closer towards the Pacific? But leave the cities to one side for the time being. The smaller, modest ways of living, describe those to us all. Well, in the area that I'm talking about, there was nobody. Um, of course, it's rather unusual when at night um, it gets dark and you don't see a single light in the whole landscape. And uh, this is an area sacred to the Mongolians where Genghis Khan is buried. When you move out of that, you're in steppe land, which is suddenly hard and the horses are happy. And it's occupied by people called Buryat, who are Mongolian people who fled south um, uh, from the Russian Civil War and settled here. So you get that north part of Mongolia, of uh, people living in dusty villages. They're mostly herdsmen. Um, and small farmers. Um, it's very poor. Uh, it's possible that climate change has made as little difference to them. But on the whole, um, it's, a, it's a land where people, if they can, they, they will get out to a city. Um, unless they are these tough, hardy horsemen who I knew, who basically are herders and sellers of, of horse. And um, then you find the river goes over the Russian border into Siberia. And there you get a very um, odd experience because the people on the far side, and this so often happens with borders, um, you look at a border and you think, oh, that's where Russians begin, or that's where Mongolians begin. It so often isn't like that. You find the people on the far side, as I did here, were actually the same as on the other side of the border. They were Buryat Mongols, and they were Buddhists, and they regarded the river as holy. They call it the Onon there, uh, the Holy Mother Onon. And it's only much later that it has a change of gender with the Russians and becomes Little Father Amur. But then you find, as you continue, that they're, they're typical small Russian villages built of wood, um, uh, farming again, small tradesmen. And oddly enough, uh, along the river itself, there's almost no activity. There's very little fishing. Um, it's as if they still have the idea that the river is not to be touched. And that's uh, a Mongolian Buddhist idea. Finally, of course, you get into Siberian Russia. And eventually, which is uh, another story for later, um, you cross the border, or I did, into China on the Chinese side of the river. But even though you're as re almost as remote as you could be on Earth, you still bump into school children wearing Arsenal Football Club shirts. You, know, you can't escape from mainstream culture. H how, do, how do the Buryats, who are much ignored and are playing a terrible role being sacrificed in the war in Ukraine, minorities being sent to the front line in particular, how do the Buryats that you were talking to relate to Moscow, to Beijing, to Ulaanbaatar? How do, the, how do the minorities that you spoke to conceive their world? How do they understand the world around them? Well, in general, they, um, Moscow, the Siberians have always had an idea that um, the sky is high, they say, and the Tsar is far away. They said this back in the Tsarist period. Um, they feel often that Moscow has abandoned them. Um, they're stuck out in Siberia. The collective farms have long ago disappeared. Um, they're mostly poor. And they feel that actually um, they are very separate from European Russia, which after all is several thousand miles to their west. Um, the distances are huge. And so the, the main feeling about belonging to Russia is that they do feel Russian. They feel that ancient or nationalism. Um, but it's, it's not as, um, there, there's also a sturdy sense of being Siberian among many of them. Tell us, I mean, I, I know, um, you know I was a Russian, or I am a Russian historian, that, that you describe how this world of Siberia in the late 19th century could have blossomed into something very, very different. I mean, there were lots of parallels at the time between Russia's east and the emerging west of the United States that opened up into the Great Plains and then eventually into the West Coast and Silicon Valley, that that hasn't happened or didn't happen in, in Russia. But you, you write a bit about Chekhov and others explaining how Siberia was a land of great hope 
how, how, why, did, why did that not materialize? Might that materialize in the, in the future? T tell us about the 19th century, how, what, what you, what, the resonance that um, was so important in your book. Um, well, in the 19th century, there was a strange idea that grew up, um, which was a fantasy. Um, it was an idea that mainly grew up in Moscow, thousands of miles to the west. They imagined that the Amur River was going to be Russia's great artery to the Pacific. They had seen that on the American continent, to, the, to miles to their east, um, there had been this great movement of, of settlers um, coming to the um, American West Coast and colonizing it. And the Pacific was getting, they imagined to be a, a great trading sea. And the Amur River, which amongst all the great rivers of Russia, is the only one that flows from west to east. So it makes a sort of artery, um, for potentially for trade. Um, and so this euphoria grew up, particularly about a place which was founded by one of the Russian czars called Nikolaev Snamur, which sits at the mouth of the Amur River on the Pacific. This was going to be a great emporium. It was going to be Russia's future, oddly enough, in alliance with the United States at that time, not in opposition to it, but sharing a sort of commonwealth. I'll just read you a tiny passage. Suddenly, the immense but little known Amur River loomed into brilliant focus. Here would be Russia's artery to the Pacific, a titanic waterway flowing as if by providence from the belly of Siberia into an ocean of infinite promise. The trading concessions wrenched from China by the British and French, the prizing open of Japan, and above all, the arrival of a young and vigorous America on the opposite coast would surely transform the Pacific into an area of world commerce. With the Russian seizure of the Amur from a helpless China in 1858, the vision of an Eastern destiny became euphoria. The Amur, as it declared, would become Russia's Mississippi. Soon, St. Petersburg, then the capital, was rife with reports of foreign merchants making for the Amur. The Lower River Valley was declared a free trade zone, and the fulcrum of these hopes was the newly founded port of Nikolaevsk at the Amur's mouth. Life was reported delightful. The Nikolaev stores were selling Havana cigars, French pate and cognac. Susceptible minds twinned the town of San Francisco. Then, within a decade, harsh realities broke in. Far from being a riverine highway, the Amur was revealed as a labyrinth of shoals, shallows and dead ends. And for seven months of the year, it was sealed in ice or drift with dangerous flows. Ships sank even in the estuary. As for the Amur shores, for hundreds of miles, they were peopled only by a sprinkling of Cossacks, natives, and subsistence farmers, many forcibly settled on poor land and open to the floods that still ravage it. For its inhabitants, this became a cursed river, not the little father of Russia's infection, wrote a dismayed naturalist, but her sickly child. I mean, amazing the, the parallels and the expectations being dashed. I mean, at this time, of course, Russia had settlements, it controlled all, all of Alaska, it sold in 1861, and had settlements on the west coast of America, around San Francisco, before the Americans did. Yep. And that Pacific dream disappeared. Now the Pacific dream is very much a Chinese one. China has, has declared itself a near-polar power because um, if you go past Russia, you get to the North Pole, which is really quite a long way. Mm. So let, let's talk a bit about the China and the Russia side of it. I mean, you, you write beautifully in the book, as, you, as you've all heard, but one of the most haunting lines is that most rivers unite. You mentioned about the Buryats on each side, but the Amur divides. T tell us about, about, about the division between Russia and China and about the different worlds you have on either side of, 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 of the Amur. Well, the relationship between Russia and China, um, which appears to us, um, certainly in Britain, as being a little threatening, um, they seem to be an alliance. But when you're on the Amur River, you realize that almost the only thing that unites uh, Russia and China 
is fear or dislike of the West. Um, on the ground, um, there's no love lost between them. Um, looking back in history, one finds a very checkered pattern. Uh, there was a treaty um, called the Treaty of Nurchings back in uh, 1689, thank you, um, uh, which was between Russia and China. And China at that time, under the Emperor Kangxi, um, was a, a formidable power. The Russians had crossed um, the huge Siberian expanse, it was Cossack expansion, um, astonishing, um, uh, six, uh, in about um, 60 years, they had crossed 3,000 miles to the Pacific, um, very fast. And suddenly, they extinguished the, or suborned the native tribes along their way, um, and suddenly they were up against a formidable enemy, China. And they had to make peace with China eventually. And that peace was forced on them virtually by the Chinese. It was very much to the Chinese advantage. Um, in the, back, back in Russia, um, the Tsar was the future Tsar Peter the Great, who was a teenager at the time. He just wanted trade concessions for the depleted Russian treasury. On, but on the Chinese side, um, it was the powerful um, starter of the Ming Dynasty, um, the Emperor Kangxi, and it was the Chinese who were in power then. And so, although the Russians achieved some uh, trade concessions, the Chinese achieved the Amur River whole and the whole basin of it to the north. The Amur River drains a basin twice the size of Pakistan, so you can imagine um, what this meant to have enormous swathes of land to the north of the Amur River in what is today Siberia, um, given to the Chinese. Then, of course, the Chinese empire began to decline, and in the mid-19th century, um, one finds uh, a belligerent governor of, of um, eastern Siberia called Moraviev simply seizing back the river from China. The Chinese were helpless to stop it. So the Russians took the river, and they have it still. And there have been all sorts of fluctuations in the Russian-Chinese relationship, um, including that, of course, in the Cultural Revolution, when the Chinese were slinging abuse at Russia in the time of Mao Zedong. Um, and it, became, it was a long time before um, the Russians and Chinese began to cohere and found their interests, they had interests in common. Um, even in the time of Deng Xiaoping, um, the liberalization, you could say, of the Chinese um, economy, um, there was a distrust of Russia. And still today, as I found um, when I was traveling on the Chinese side, there's a feeling that that treaty which gave the Amur to Russia was unequal. They still refused to accept it. Um, they call it an unequal treaty. And it lingers there in the Chinese conscious. On the ground, you find that the Russians and Chinese, they don't learn one another's languages hardly. There's very little intermarriage. There used to be a healthy trade between the two countries. But such is the Chinese economy, so high and so um, now overbearingly superior to that of the Russian ruble that um, the Russians can no longer afford along the Amur to buy all those Chinese domestic goods um, which they, would, they still covet. So the situation is a very um, complicated one, much more complicated than it seems to be. But I remember talking to Russian traders on the far side of the river saying, what do you think of the Chinese? And they said, well, the Chinese, they're very hard working. We have to acknowledge that, but they have closed hearts. T tell us a bit about that. I mean, the, the, the story of Russia and China's alliance and so on, it would be great to touch on that a little bit. But the, the, those divisions and those problems, that delicate balance, I mean, it's also a demographic one. So on the northern banks of the Amur, hardly anybody. And then these, these not just towns, big cities, appearing up on the south, southern side. Tell us a bit about the, the demographic, the vibrance or apparent vibrancy on one side and then, and then the, the desolateness on the other. Well, you can understand why the Russians in Siberia are afraid of being swamped by the Chinese. Um, 
On the Chinese side, um, on the provinces along the Amo River, um, the numbers are about 110 million. Um, on the Russian side, it's approximately 2 million. Um, and they are uh, mostly, um, it, it's a population that if, it is, if anything, in decline. Um, I spoke to a number of Russians, who, some of whom were quite paranoid um, about what might happen to them, even after uh, the Chinese no longer want to or can uh, do trade with them. The Russians can't afford it. I'll read you a brief passage um, about that, um, about the Russian fear. Um, it, it's, uh, um, it, it seems extreme, or seemed extreme to me, um, but to ordinary Russians, um, that sense that they are in peril of being swamped um, was very real. And Connor, just remind us, you're, you, when, we, when, when did you do your travel? Was it 2021? This is before the war began. This is, uh, this is before the war, yes, yeah. long before. It's about uh, now, it's, it's hesitant to say it's four years ago now, okay. but okay. nothing too much has changed along okay. the armor. Um, the fear, the, the, this um, misgiving, they say, uh, um, is, uh, is an old one now. These fears have a troubled hinterland. For 30 years, until 1987, the two powers lived in strident enmity. Early estimates of Chinese infiltration maintained that as many as two million had crossed into the Russian Far East. The wilder estimates have abated, but the fear has not gone. Illegal migrants evade any statistics, people say, while an old anxiety surfaces that Moscow is far away and has abandoned them. A few years ago, a Russian documentary, China, a Deadly Friend, went viral on the internet. A vendor in the market, a well-dressed woman trying to sell Siberian furs, murmurs to me that the Chinese are coming back and they're everywhere. She could not tell me exactly where, because they lived unseen, she said, waiting. Such rumors were stoked by alarmist local newspapers that the Chinese lurked in the forests, in closed communities, and always they're seen not as persons, but as a composite mass. Images of insects and pollutants abound. But no such forests have ever been located Recent statistics for the number of Chinese living in Russia's Far East assess them at a modest 30,000. The Chinese themselves are reluctant to stay. The weather is bitter, they told me. The police rapacious, the people hostile. Intermarriage is rare, although some Russian women declare a preference for Chinese men, more diligent and sober than their own. Above all, with the collapse of the ruble against the Chinese yuan, business opportunities have faded away. Now, how do you see that turning out? I mean, the, the expressions of eternal friendship that we've heard at, at political level. I mean, you, you were in uh, this region when there were very substantial war games, uh, or joint military exercises, I should say, yes. being carried out by the Chinese and the Russian troops. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you think, I mean, I hear a lot of those very similar um, stories, paranoias, anxieties about jobs being taken, in particular about um, local women being sort of married off by, to, to Chinese entrepreneurs and business people. You hear that a lot all over Central Asia. And as you just exactly rightly said, the, the statistics don't seem to bear it out. But it's a, it's a constant fear and an anxiety. And you, you mentioned that you thought it was a, a paranoia of some kind, but you can see where that kind of comes from. Yes. Do, do you think that that relationship between Russia and China and the balance, the demographics, c can you see that becomes a source of, uh, of, of, uh, of tension in the future? I mean, lots of Chinese people have started to talk about the treaties of Nechinsk, uh, of Nechinsk and, and, and subsequently Russia's expansion into China's territories. We saw last year state-approved maps changing the names of Russian cities into their Chinese equivalents mm -hmm. that was interpreted, interpreted by some as at least preparing the ground to say, we have some grounds for dispute about whether these lands should be exploited by those of us who have capital. Mm -hmm. How would you imagine that, that, that work, these worlds start to change in the, in the coming years? This is very difficult to say because at the moment, the rhetoric about this is very, very subdued. Um, the Chinese have refused um, to rescind their 
categorization of that treaty, which was so unfair to them, they say, um, un unequally, they call it an unequal treaty, which in Chinese terminology is, is interesting and equivocal. They have officially established the border uh, along the Amur River. Um, and there you could see great boulders inscribing the treaty, which finished in about, they didn't really complete it in 2004, it was actually really established. Um, and uh, so it's very muted. At the same time, um, when I was on the Chinese side of the river, which I crossed and traveled over, the Russian side is heavily fortified. It's astonishing. It's the most heavily fortified border on earth, the Russian-Chinese one. And the fortifications are all on the Russian side. Um, the barbed wire, um, watch posts everywhere, um, hermetically sealed, um, two, two ranks of of barbed wire with raked earth in between which will betray the passage of anybody trying to cross. Um, so, but on the Chinese side when I went over, uh, it was completely relaxed. There were a few watchtowers there, um, otherwise uh, nothing. But um, the future is hard to see. Um, I can, one can't imagine two nuclear powers going to war with one another even in the distant, rather more distant future. What you can imagine much more is the Chinese economic infiltration of this area, as indeed it's happening in Central Asia. Um, and you know, the Chinese even have soldiers now in Tajikistan, which has alarmed the, alarmed the Russians. Um, but but um, one can see that the Chinese, they want um, Russian raw materials. Um, the Russians have nothing to buy from the Chinese, they can't afford to, although now they are buying weapons, they're buying intercontinental ballistic missiles, it seems, as well as intelligence equipment. This is an extraordinary reversal of fortune um, when in the past it was the Russians who were the predominant industrial power. Now it's the Chinese who are selling them stuff. But um, one can't imagine um, uh, that there would be a military confrontation, but there might be a slow suborning of this whole area um, by Chinese business interests. Um, they're already in charge of many of the logging facilities, and the Siberian forests are enormous. It's one-fifth of the forest of the entire Earth is Siberia, and the Chinese are busy extracting logs from it at a rate, possibly, of every year clearing it to the size of Belgium. So there's a huge extraction of oil, there's an extraction of gas, and this is what the Chinese want from it. And the Russians need their money, it has to say. So at the moment, um, one can only see um, uh, uh, the infiltration of business interests, uh, some of them government-sponsored. So, so tell us, as you come, as you came to, as you come towards the end of, your, end of your journey, the Pacific calling, could you tell us the, the last sort of few weeks and, d weeks and days of the journey as you could feel the Pacific, you eventually start to hear its roar. How, do, do you feel a sense of achievement, a, a tristesse that you're coming towards the end? These, all these lost and missed opportunities of a world that could have turned out in a different way, but for by the nature, politics, etc. The sort of the sadness and the greyness of so much of the world that you're walking through, the expanses of land where you don't see anybody, but also you don't see many trees. It's very desolate, difficult countryside. When you, when you come towards the end, paint us a little picture of, of Nikolaevsk. Tell us a picture of the Pacific Basin that you, you get, and also of the, of the feelings inside your heart and mind. Um. Well, the river changes as it moves out of the most of Siberia. It turns to the north, and for 600 miles it moves to the Pacific. It's become enormous by then. You can hardly see one side to the other. I was traveling with Russian poachers who I'd fallen in with who were poaching fish um, on the far side. I remember um, one couldn't help sympathizing with these people. They are depleting the fish, of course. Um, of this river, which is already somewhat polluted by Chinese industrial tributaries to its south. Um, so um, I, I felt a sort of sadness, in a way, for the river and for the people on it. Um, as the Russians are, they're wonderfully helpful. Um, I, I found that um, they, uh, they were 
wonderfully, marvelously outspoken. There's a sort of energy there which comes from long ago, the Siberian independence, and um, very warm, very hospitable. And um, I, because they were um, now in mainly poor and, um, uh, and with a feeling that they had to work the system somehow rather than the system was going to support them, um, I felt a, a certain sadness, I think, at the end, the lost dream, of course. But there was also, and perhaps I should read you one brief passage, um, when I was arrested at, um, one time and for, uh, in a small uh, Siberian village, or small town, really, um, by the police. They didn't know who I was. Um, it seemed too peculiar that this um, old foreigner was wandering about. Um, I had a bad limp by then. I was speaking my bad Russian, and uh, they didn't understand me. But um, the next day, after putting me through this drill, I think they went back or emailed back to um, some provincial capital. They looked me up on Wikipedia or something and found that I was a um, genuine travel writer. And suddenly they became very uh, exorbitantly ho uh, hospitable to me and said, you must now speak to our local secondary school. So after emerging almost from police custody, I went to this secondary school, and it was a lesson in um, what these um, poor people's children um, had to cope with. I'd love to be a fly on the wall in the Thruborn household. I mean, it's a standard day being arrested in the morning and then at the children's school in the afternoon. But, um, yeah, let's hear. The pupils stand up hesitantly as I enter. Fifteen shy faces, mostly girls. They're plainly dressed in jeans in black and have fringes and utilitarian top knots. They can hardly speak English at all. I talk slowly and clearly, but they do not understand, nor often does the teacher. We revert to Russian, which she interprets into pidgin English. These are language students. I ask them their ambitions to go on to university, perhaps, to become engineers, doctors, nurses, but nobody answers. They'd have to pay for university, the teacher says, and their parents cannot. Maybe one or two will go part-time while working. It will be very hard. I realize now that I've arrived at a different aerospace with my talk of selecting one profession over another or of getting to university. They come from poor villages, the teacher later tells me. They'd be lucky to find jobs at all. Their parents are probably out of work, and of course, their parents drink. I feel belatedly ashamed. I'd imagine other lives for them. When I ask them, a little despairingly, if they'd like to go abroad, the faces go empty again. Only a stout boy says he was once in Georgia, in the high mountains and by the sea. Nobody else has ever seen a sea. All their world comes through the intensity of their little phones that they cradle in front of them, their music, their friends, and their intermittent news. They scramble together some English eventually from their mobile phones. Then they ask in a chorus, where are the prettiest girls? Perhaps I'm trying to unsettle their thoughts a little or divert nationalism when I answer briskly, India, <laughs> India and Italy, it's in the book. <laughs> the trickle of laughter that had started dies away. I sense a vague affront. The ginger-haired boy says, what about our Russian girls? I'm not enjoying this. They're beautiful too, I say. Wonderful. Great. Well, I think we should have some questions. I promise you I won't ask the question that I hate most of all, which is what's your next book about, because uh, we're not here for that. Mm -hmm. uh, but let's have some hands up. At the, and I'd like some hands at the back, please, and especially from young people, if anybody thinks they're young, that counts too. Uh, but let's see some hands. Yes, there's, there's one right at the back, please. More hands, please, so I can point the microphones towards you. Uh, thank the, you very much. The one at the front, please. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I have a question for both of you. In light of uh, 
the new found friendship between Russia and China. What do you all feel as the, you know, the way forward? Because the, you know, they're, they're allies now. And, uh, you know, since you all have traveled and you, you both are experts on, China, on Russia and China and, you know, looking at that. Give me your views, please. Okay. Um, what is the way forward? Yeah. Ooh, um, it's a very hard question, and I wish I knew a, a, a likely answer. Um, the world changes so quickly um, that it's very hard to predict. Um, one looks back, not very far back in the Cultural Revolution in about uh, 1969, um, when the Russians and Chinese were virtually at war with one another over a small island in a tributary of the Amur. And um, the Russians had to clear the Chinese off the island with a massive bombardment. And, um, and, and this is, uh, you know, within living memory. Um, I wish I knew what the way forward would be. You would hope that for the Russians' sake, um, they would begin to be able to afford Chinese goods again instead of just importing arms. Um, you would hope for the Chinese sake um, that they could um, begin at least to see the Russians more as, a, a, as human beings and less the, as a, a sort of economic resort in the way of raw materials. It, it's, a, it's a hard question. And for us in the West, um, we hope always for more understanding of these two great giants which we too readily think of as uh, uh, one massive opposition. Uh, I think w w I would say that there are probably two answers. One is, as with Colin's book, the relationship between China and Russia in frontier lands is acute and it's, and it's constant on either side of this great river. Uh, but bro broadly speaking, from my experience, I spent, you know, I've just been in, in China earlier this month, uh, the amount of time that is spent by Chinese officials, policy makers, academics, business people thinking about Russia is approximates around about 0% of the time. You know, the, there is an importance in kind of policy meetings with people with PowerPoint presentations, but in terms of the main brain in, in, in Beijing or the commercial brain in Shanghai and elsewhere, Russia is a source of, as Colin says, is a source of raw materials and it's a question of price. Can you get them at a better price than you could before the war started, which the answer is yes. Beyond that, the strategic overlap is very easy to over-exaggerate. And it's very easy in, in policy worlds to see shadows everywhere. So most relationships between India and its neighbors, between India and the, the quad that you'll hear something about tomorrow, um, you know, they are transactional. Most of us try to make things work, that it works for both of us. But we shouldn't get carried away by uh, expressions of eternal friendship. You know, one wants to know what those actually really mean. So uh, I'd be a bit more cynical and distant from trying to think this through at a, at a really proper level. Yes, there was a lady in the front. More hands, please. And then a, a lady here. Thank you. Uh, I read the book. Uh, and uh, what I noticed, actually, that you wrote quite a lot about the logistics and also about the help of local guides and local people. And I think this is something that is really often uh, omitted in travel literature. And you really acknowledge their work. And to what extent this is important for you to now acknowledge the, the, the work of local guides who really made your journey possible as far as I understood from the book? I mean, without them, uh, you would not uh, cross these lands. It's a great question, yes. Uh, yes. Um, the world, world of local guides, should I answer this, I think? Yes, please, yeah. Um, yes, um, they were invaluable. Um, I didn't, it was impossible to get them in advance, I found. Um, and uh, mainly they were less guides than ordinary Russian people in particular. And um, one Chinese man who was very sweet who accompanied me for 500 miles along the Russian shore most of my way there. But these people were met by chance and most of them were not professional guides at all. I had one um, in the end of my journey, a Russian Siberian, very, um, very Siberian. And um, he, was, he I'd found on the internet, which is something I never normally do, being hopeless with technology. And he said he would take people fishing um, in the lower part of the Amur River. And he was wonderful. And um, so I was enormously grateful for this, in my case, very small handful of people, because usually I was traveling alone without guide. Um, you just, you can't employ them. Um, and so uh, 
you, you're very much uh, dependent on chance. This, this Russian, I have to say, um, uh, was one of the few that I've kept in touch with on the internet. And I asked him, um, what about the war in Ukraine? But I did it not really, um, I was back in England. I just said, how are you, how's your family? I left out uh, Putin, Ukraine, Kremlin on the internet, um, imagining he might be overheard. But typical Siberian, he came back right away and he said, as soon as we can get rid of that, get, get rid of that little Putin, that little prick in the Kremlin, the better. Um, <laughs> so un absolutely unafraid, um, which is rather marvelous from a, a Russian. Well, th there's an election coming up in Russia, so we'll see whether those prayers get altered. There's a young lady here. Uh, more hands, please. Gentleman in the front as well. Anybody else? Please wave vigorously so I can see my eyesight, not what it was. Lady behind next. Yes, please. Uh, so my question is that after the Russia-Ukraine war, which is going out, will the China will be more powerful out because uh, it is focusing upon de-dollarization as well as using... Uh, currency of China, the Russia is doing because of the Katsa which has been applied on Russia. So can we say it's the compulsion of Russia to be more dependent on China for yes. most of its ex exports part? And also we have seen that in uh, the US foreign policy, it has been mentioned that in the 2050s, if we see, the China is the rising power which can replace US as such. So, uh, will it be a ground for Russia to overcome this war? Because we have seen that whether Russia win or lose in the uh, Russia Ukraine war, okay. it is always the Russia to be defeated because it will lose. Okay, great. Such. Will you pass the microphone to the lady behind you, and then we'll have the gentleman at the front. We'll do all three together, and then we have to wrap up. Yeah, it's uh, fascinating to hear about your travels, uh, China and Russia, very much in the news. And my question is somewhat related to what she just said. I mean, uh, you talked about the friendship not being too uh, committed in the sense from the China side to Russia. And uh, the argument now uh, is that half the world is, is on the side of Russia because, uh, of course, they're not vehemently taking up for the people of Ukraine. Do you see China in some way supporting Russia so as to seem as a better friend? Okay, going and then, forward. And then the last one, if you can get the, the microphone to the gentleman in the front, and that will be our last one, and we'll try and do all three. I think you mentioned that um, the climate has changed its uh, uh, effects in the area visibly a little bit. I was wondering whether on the, either the Chinese or the Russian side, there's any effort so as to make great strategic use of um, the lands alongside the Amo and resettle people there. So I can't quite hear you. I'm just saying, say this a bit louder. Um, any uh, evidence that either the Chinese side or the Russian side are trying to settle the area around the Amo with climate change making the area a little less inhospitable? Okay. okay. China's that... rise? Uh, will the Russian war accelerate China's rise? Oh. <laughs> well, as I mentioned before, um, the Russians are being tacitly supported by China. Um, not very overtly, um, but... Um, I, I think the Russian, the Russian fall um, or the expense of, of the Ukraine um, is in, in a way almost irrelevant to the Chinese rise. The Chinese rise is inexorable. Um, their gross national product is many, many times more than Russia has uh, achieved in, in generations. Um, so I'm not sure that the war is particularly going to help China. China doesn't need help. Um, it's, uh, it's enormously the dominant power economically. The gross national product 10 years ago um, was something like uh, four times in China's favor. It's now probably 100 times. It's massive. And uh, Russia is nowhere. And last one, Colin, about climate, climatic changes. And you, you mentioned that the, the, these fields might be redeveloped. Do you see climate change being part of an issue in Siberia? That's um, not obviously. Um, the lower part of the river is the one that is most vulnerable because it's subject to huge flooding. And uh, we're told to stop. Um, and <laughs> You're so allowed to finish the sentence, I think, on the TV game shows when it does that. You can finish the sentence. Please. Uh, right. Par paragraph. Um, the, um, 
the river is subject to enormous floods, and it's easy to see these as a result of climate change until you read early historic accounts of the area, and it's always been subject to huge floods, but it's pretty bad. And um, above all, the, the pollution um, from Chinese industrial cities to the south um, has damaged the river in its lower courses. So that is the main, uh, the main uh, pollutant, I'd say, and the main issue is um, pollution, I think, rather than literally climate change at the moment. Can I say a quick um, round of applause to the volunteers, the audio guys, the cameras, our signer, and above all, to the wonderful Colin Thubron. <laughs>